So I want to thank, uh, thank Tony and Claudia for inviting me to give this talk. And when Claudia first invited me, she asked if I could uh, maybe give a little bit of an introduction on how I ended up doing a PhD in the US because we're here talking to LIO students. I know there are more people uh, here attending this webinar, but I'll give a brief introduction about how I started doing my BA uh, at the Federal University uh, of Rio Grande do Sul and how now I'm doing my PhD in Northern Arizona. And this also relates to my research interest and the motivation to do my research. So this is why the subtitle of my talk is from learner to teacher to researcher, because I want to share with you how I ended up in this topic. And let's go. So background about uh, how we started this. So in 2013, if you are from Brazil, you know that there was this program, the Idioms Without Borders. At that point, it was called English Without Borders. And I was one of the first teachers in this program at this university. And what we were doing was preparing students to go abroad in the Science Without Borders program. With the development of the program, the goal changed, but we were mainly teaching students how to write and speak for academic purposes. And I was mainly teaching in this program for two years. So I was there teaching my students how to write for their classes and also how to prepare to go abroad. And one of the things that I noticed is that mainly we're teaching students how to write abstracts, research articles and proposals because they had to write a proposal to submit to apply to go abroad. And I never saw any problem with that. And I still think this is very helpful for Brazilians who are going to study abroad or who, are, or who want to attend a conference uh, in another country or a conference that happens in English. But when I started doing my MA, so I did my MA in ELT, which is the same as TESOL for the US uh, at Warwick University, I noticed that as a student, I was asked to write different registers. I wasn't being asked to write a research article. I wasn't being asked to write an abstract. It was a different type of assignment that I couldn't really grasp. I had the language knowledge. I knew I was proficient in academic English, but I wasn't really sure on how to convey the purpose of those assignments. And then I started to talk to my students, the ones who I had taught at Idioms Without Borders and who had gone abroad. And most of them also had this um, difficulty, but they couldn't quite place it. And at that point was when I decided to start compiling a corpus of Brazilian undergrads who were in the UK because that's where I was doing part of their undergrad. So most of the students, they did two years in Brazil of their undergrad and then they went to the UK to do a year uh, abroad or a semester of their university. And with this corpus, I actually, for my master's, I study how they use academic vocabulary, but I knew there was something else that I wanted to study. And that's how I ended up doing my PhD in Applied Linguistics at NAU. And if you were here for last week's webinar with uh, Viviana Cortez, she said that she knew she had something she wanted to study. And then when she started her PhD, she took this seminar with Doug Biber. And in that seminar, she ended up uh, having to study to present about lexical bundles. And kind of the same thing when I heard her talk about this in her webinar, I was like, yes, Kind of the same thing happened to me. So in my first semester, I took this class on register variation. I was like, oh, this is actually my question that's been in my mind for such a long time. So that's how I decided on my PhD topic. And today what I'm going to present to you guys, it's my pilot research. So it's kind of a tentative study towards my dissertation. And I would be glad to get some questions and comments on this paper. So let's try, I know that we're, uh, we're here on this webinar and it's difficult to have interaction. So I have an idea on how we're gonna do this. We can use the chat, okay? Because I have some questions for you. So if your answer is yes, you can just write yes on the chat. So who here has taught or teaches right now university writing classes? So classes for students, like composition classes, for example, or any type of writing classes. So write on the chat, I can see you there. <laughs> Just say yes, yes, I see EAP writing skills, a lot of me, me, me. Okay, there are more questions here. 
I like that there are some of them that are like sort of. So if you teach writing classes, okay, I want to know if you have taught students how to write a lab report. So again, I'm waiting for the yeses. I hope to have some yeses. Okay, I see some of them shining there. Uh, yes, okay, I have a no. No. Who has taught how to write a case study? Uh, uh, design specification, that's kind of odd. Proposals, I assume proposals might be the register that most people have taught. This is great, yay, so happy to see you all here. Okay, so what I've been thinking is when students get into their disciplinary classes, they are asked to write these types of texts and these types of assignments. But we, what we are teaching as teachers, it's mainly how to write an argumentative essay, a narrative essay, sometimes a proposal. I'm not saying that we're all ignoring these registers. I'm sure some people are teaching them. But at least in my experience in the programs that I have taught so far, we're mainly teaching these classes, argumentative essay, informative essays, or literature reviews. And the problem with this, oops, so the problem with this is that mainly these registers, they ask students to display English skills. When they are in our class, they are more worried about the grade we're giving them in their language, right? And also we're asking them to practice a limited amount of communicative purposes. So they are here practicing how to argue, how to narrate, but are we really giving them a chance to practice all the different purposes that they will have to write for their content classes? And we do have a lot of research on second language writing, but most of it focuses on what do students write for composition classes. So this type of classes like writing before you go to university or the writing class that you take as in your first semester. We have a lot of research describing also assessment writing. So for example, the text students write for TOEFL or the text students write for IELTS. Or also we see a lot of graduate classes in English Applied Linguistics Department because, let's be honest, it's accessible to us. And if we're collecting texts from L2 graduate students, we probably have them in our classrooms. But what I am interested as a teacher and as a researcher is actually what are the students that I am preparing right now to join their majors going to have to write once they join their majors? So my goal is to describe the linguistic patterns of text that L2 students write for their university classes. And when I say university classes, I mean their content classes. And my research questions that I try to answer here is what are the underlying dimensions of linguistic variation across registers in L2 writing? And how does this variation relate to L1 writing? So not only I want to describe what L2 students are doing in their content classes. I also want to compare how they relate to L1 writing. So methods. So as I said, my corpus come from a group of students who are doing part of their undergrad in England. So they are Brazilian students. I only have for this study a Portuguese background and they're all writing in English in the UK. And this is how the corpus is organized right now. So I have different types of assignments here. I have argumentative essays, case studies, research reports, critiques, designs. And all of these texts were double coded by me and my research assistant. And that's how we put them into categories. So if you remember, I also want to know about the differences between L1 and L2 writing. So in order to compare, to do this comparison, I also use Bowie, which is the British Academic Written English Corpus. And for this study, I only use the third year of Bowie. So these are native speakers who are in their third year of undergrad, and I'm comparing them to my students. Because the reason why I chose this third year, it's because they are in the same level. So if you remember when I started this, I said that Brazilian students, they had to do at least two years. They had to have 50% of their undergrad completed before they travel to the UK. So in this case, I wanted to have the same level of study. And for these two corpora, some of the registers are actually the same. So case study, critique, design, exercises, literature survey, methodology, methodology recounts, which are lab reports, proposal and research reports are the same in L1 and L2. So I'm going to compare this 
uh, registers too. And for the analysis, so I conducted a multidimensional analysis. And if you are, if you are, or if you were involved with NAU research or with Tony's research, I'm sure you know all about the statistics behind uh, multidimensional analysis. But I also am guessing that some people here are not familiar with uh, multidimensional analysis. So a multidimensional analysis relies on doing a factor analysis and extracting factors. And the easiest way that I find to explain what a multidimensional analysis is, is thinking about a soup. I know we're in quarantine and everyone now are becoming cookers. So yes, a multidimensional analysis, it's part of your <laughs> cooking. <laughs> so when we start a multidimensional analysis, we have a lot of linguistic variables. So let's think of this as ingredients. When you're making your soup, you have your water or your broth, you put all the ingredients in, and some of them will float and some of them will go to the bottom. And the reason why some of them will float is because they share the same property. So let's say carrots and potatoes, they will float, but meats and noodles will go to the bottom because they share the same properties. So a multidimensional analysis, the same thing is happening. You have the linguistic variables that occur together going to one side of a dimension and the linguistic ver variables that occur together but in complement distribution, they go to the other side of the dimension. So this is what we have. So we are identifying the linguistic variables that tend to occur together. And Again, as a soup, if I make, if I put a lot of tomatoes, I'll be making a soup, a tomato soup. But if I put a lot of carrots, I'll be making a carrot soup. So the linguistic features that I add to my multidimensional analysis are really important to the outcome of to the dimensions I'll extract. So for my study, I actually used the features in two previous studies. So Gardner, Nessie, and Biber, they did the multidimensional analysis of uh, Bowie. So it's already a corpus of student writing. And Hardy and Frihinal, they did a multidimensional analysis of my cusp. So I relied on the features that they found to be interesting to add to my multidimensional analysis. So if you are interested in more things about multidimensional analysis, this was a very crude explanation, but Tony actually has a great book. Uh, she, he edited it with Marcia, I think, and it's research methods, it's multidimensional analysis research methods. It's from last year, and it explains step by step how to conduct one, and it has articles from different people. It's very interesting, so I recommend you check that if you have more questions about the methods. So results. So these are actually the five dimensions I extracted, and again, the factor analysis is going to give me the features, the factor loading for each features. And it is me, the researcher, the person who is doing this meta, this multidimensional analysis that has to interpret the dimensions. So to do that, I actually look at the texts that have a high factor loading in each of these dimensions and I look how these features are correlated. So how are they happening together and what are they trying to express? So for this study, I have five dimensions, and you can see that each of them has a side. Remember that sides don't mean that one thing is good and one thing is bad. It just means that the things that are on top happen together, the things that are below happen together, and they don't tend to occur together. So for the first dimension, I have expression of personal opinion versus compressed procedure information. For the second dimension, expression of possibility. For uh, the other side, accounts of completed events. Dimension three has informational density versus engaging presentations. And for this discussion here, I won't be able to talk about all of the dimensions because I want to have time for questions, but I will focus on the first uh, dimension. So the first dimension we have is expression of personal opinion versus compressed procedural information. And if you have seen the multidimensional analysis study before, you're probably familiar with this graph here on our right, left, on our left. So here it shows the dimension scores for each of these texts. So you can see if you look at the top, you have problem question L1. This means there are problem question texts written by native speakers. They have more features related to expression of personal opinion. And if you look at the bottom, we have design specification written by L1. This means that design specification, the register we were talking about, has more features of compressed procedural information. 
And everything that's in italics is actually the L2 students, and everything that's not in italics, it's actually the native speaker students. So the first thing I did was to run an ANOVA on each of these just to see if they were uh, different, right? If students are not doing just writing the same thing. And even looking at the fact at the dimension scores, you can see that they are different because they spread out in the dimension. But let's see how this actually happens in the text. So we're talking about expression of personal opinion. How are students doing this, right? So here I have a critique written by an L2 student and the features associated with this uh, dimension. It's third person pronouns, tense adverbs, animate nouns, finite tense noun complement clauses, perfect aspect and non-finite tense noun complement clauses. So here on this excerpt, we actually have the student is writing a critique about a book and we can see the use of third person pronouns and also noun complement clauses with stance nouns. And actually, I selected this text because it's very interesting. I think it's one of the highest scoring on this dimension for L2 students. But actually, it's not an expression of personal opinion because in this text, the student is uh, expressing the opinion of the character in this book. So he says, Julia, which is the character states right from the beginning of the story that she does not like to cook. Uh, she only does it for her family and she hates the fact that she has to cook. So the person who has personal opinion in this excerpt is actually the character. And this is very different from the other texts. As you can see here, we have a narrative essay. And in this case, the student is talking about these two different architects. So it has nouns, right, proper nouns. And you also see uh, noun complement clauses, like, for example, the recognition that has put them between the most admired architects in the world. So you can see that the students are expressing their opinion about this, the work of these two architects. And looking at the other side of this dimension, for compressed procedural information, we have, for example, exercise. And we can see that this is already a very different type of discourse because it has a lot of pre-modifying nouns, common nouns, passive voice, concrete nouns, quantitative nouns, and action verbs. And we can see here that it's very even difficult to understand as the microstrip lines get closer, it can be noticed in transmission coefficient. So it has a lot of words that we associate with academic writing. This means like noun, noun, uh, sequences. But more importantly, it has this description of procedures that are associated with action verbs and passive voice. So for example, can be checked and the transmission coefficient goes, it's an action verb, right? So in this case, the student's trying to take himself out of this report, it's very different than expressing opinion. He's describing the process of using this machine in which he is describing this exercise. But remember that one of my research questions is actually the difference between L1 and L2 writing the same registers. So I want to know when we put them together, are they the same? And actually, if we look at the results of this t test, so this is just comparing the mean dimension score of one register written by L1 student and the other register written by L2 student. If we look at this, most of the registers actually are not statistically significant, so it means that they are doing the same thing, except for case study and design. And let's see what's happening here. So for design, when L2, when L1 students write, so these are students in Bowie, they're using more features of compressed procedural information. So you can see that they have a lot of uh, explanations and passive voice. You can see that they have vital medical procedure, many cases, and to be accurately controlled. We have these features that are usually associated with reporting, with reporting of a procedure. Okay, so it's way more academic in a way because the student is distancing him or herself. While when students, L2 students write the same register, they use way more features of expression of professional, of personal opinion. For example, we need to help us and it has, we needing as output needing just a bit of programming or has to be divided. So here the student is positioning himself more when writing a design. And this also occurs in case studies. For example, here we can see that 
second language students are saying this is very important or it is not possible while L1 students are using passive voice again. So rating is given and is translated. So we have two different sides here. L2 students are using more expression of personal opinion when writing these registers and L1 students are using more features associated with compressed procedural information. So this was the first dimension, but let's take a look also at the second dimension, which is expression of possibility versus an account of completed events. And I was really interested in this dimension because most MDs of student writing that I have read have found this expression of possibility. And I do associate with a specific register, you see it soon. So again, we have here the same graph, right? And I think this is really helpful to visualize how these registers appear in this dimension. So we have expression of possibility being super high in proposals written by native speakers and empathy writing also, but we have account of completed events being more common in lab reports for both L1 and L2 writing. And again, this is the results of the ANOVA then comparing the registers. So expression of possibility. What is expression of possibility? So it's usually using models, present tense, and subordinators like if. So here we can see the BFS is preferred if there are multiple solutions, BFS will always find and return the shell with one. So it is explaining in this case how to use the BFS, which to be honest, I don't know what it is. So here it's giving the different options. So it explains how to use it, but also giving the different outcomes if you adopt something different. While an account of completed events, we have, for example, in this case study, it has present tense, past tense verbs, and proper nouns. And this is different than reporting a procedure because in this case, the author is actually just reporting something that happened in the past. So we do have a passive voice, like for example, was built, but we have a lot of just past verbs talking about what happened in the past. So this case study is about this bridge, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, and the student is actually just describing what were the problems with this bridge and how it was built, the story of how it happened. So it's different than the previous one because this is looking, this is not reporting the different possibilities. And again, if I look at the difference between L1 and L2 writing, I only have case study again being different because in L1 writing, students use more if for ex use more expression of possibility for case studies, while for L2 writing, they use more account of completed events. And actually, this has already been the use of expression of possibility in case studies by L1 writers was something that I expected because in case study, we see a lot of uh, other possibilities. So for example, in the medical case study, when the teacher gives the student a case of a treatment, the student has to report what are the different possibilities that he or she considered. And in this case, we can see if pest control is to be an issue, it might be adventurous to plan the roles parallel. So it's giving the different possibilities to deal with this uh, Pest control problem is actually a plantation uh, thing in this assignment. While the L2 students, they are reporting the completing events, so they are mainly reporting how things happened instead of the different possibilities that they were that they had in their minds. And looking at the third dimension, uh, we have informational density versus engaging presentations. And here again, we can see that design has more features of engaging presentations and literature survey has more feature of informational density. And what is informational density? So this is actually the things that we associate with academic writing, like long words, nominalizations, again, pre-modifying nouns, type token ratios, and past tense verbs. So we see here, for example, in face of those environmental problems discussed above, it is noticeable that urban development plans so lots of now now sequences and sustainability, which is also a nominalization. So we see that in these registers, the student is using, it's giving more information in a short number of words. While for engaging presentation, which is very common in designs, the student is trying to present 
this object because designs are usually describing what an object does and describing the features of this object in a way that's engaging to the reader. So we have uh, definite articles, attributive adjectives, and action verbs. And one of the things to be mindful about is that in all of the MDs of student writing that I've seen so far, this is actually the only one that extracted definite articles as one of the significant uh, features in the dimensions. And I'm guessing it's because there are some Portuguese influence here, but I haven't addressed this yet. So you can see also in the second one, this defines the, compo the component interfaces for the bracket. There is a lot of trying to make something that was supposed to be boring to make it more engaging and show the characteristics of uh, this object. And again, looking at the difference, actually exercise this time, it's different between L1 and L2 writing. So, and this happens because for L1 writing, exercises are way more focused on informational density. So basically just saying what the thing is doing while for L2 writing, they might have the same view that I do of this register that sometimes the design is just a boring thing to describe and they're trying to make it more interesting. So they're saying uh, using a peripheral device for this. So they are trying to give more information about this exercise. So let's go back to my research questions and what I'm trying to do here. So for the dimensions of variation that were identified. So yes, I found five dimensions and the, we have expression of personal opinion versus compressed procedure information, expression of possibility versus an account of completed events, information of density versus engaging presentation, involved academic writing versus elaborate descriptions, which is something a little bit different, and stands towards the work of others. And what I find here is actually that students, when they go to their content classes, they're doing a lot of things aside from arguing, from narrating, and from going back to describing something. Of course, they're doing these things too. But if we think about teaching, what we writing teachers, a lot of people said that they were writing teachers can do. So one of the things to implement in our classrooms is to actually give opportunity for students to practice writing these registers in their English classes. And if you're teaching a different language, also in their other language classes, because the writing class, it's the safe environment where they can practice this before they go to their content class. So it is our job to teach those. And having these, having a list of the features that happen together to express these different purposes can help us as a teacher to develop tests for the students and also to give students examples of how these linguistic features are used in university registers because if we just focus on, oh, these are the grammar things that you need to know to write for academic purposes, but we need to show students how to do that. And most of the teachers that I talk to about this, they say, well, yes, we need to give opportunities for students to practice writing these registers, but we also don't have the content knowledge to teach the students how to write, for example, a lab report. Larissa, I don't have a laboratory in my English writing class. What can I do? As teachers, what we actually have to do is to teach students how to use the linguistic features necessary so we can think about, so when we're doing a lab report, we're actually reporting a procedure, so not why not ask students to report an everyday procedure? For example, if they're cooking their multidimensional analysis soup, they can report that procedure because they will be using these features. They are trying to achieve this communicative purpose, but with a different content. Our job is the English writing, the content they'll bring from their disciplines. And then critiques, for example, it's easy for students to write a critique of a book, of a movie, or a TV show. And and if you remember, I also had this uh, question about the difference between L1 and L2 writing. And one thing that I want to emphasize is that for most of these dimensions, most of the registers in them actually are the same, but we have some of them that are different. For example, the case study and design, case study and exercise for these different dimensions. And what can we do again as teachers? So, one of the things that we can do is to explicitly teach these linguistic resources used to express these communicative purposes that the students are not using in these assignments. But 
they probably already know these linguistic resources. What they don't uh, see is how they can be using them in these assignments. And what we can do is give examples. So we can always bring text, bring text from Bawe, which has both L1 and L2 of students writing their L1, of L1 students and L2 students writing the same register and ask why are they doing different things. This is not to say that the L2 students need to do exactly the same as the L1 students. We can do this in the L1 class too, but to say that there are two different ways to get to this assignment and students have to be able to see the differences between these two ways. And also implementing our class, teaching these features together. So do not teach all the verb tenses and then teach all the different pronouns instead of try to teach the things that happen together. And so, as I said in the beginning, this is actually my pilot paper. This is what we write before uh, we start working on our dissertation. And the future steps for me, at least here, is uh, to look at students from other language backgrounds. So I started the study looking at only Brazilians speaking in English, writing in English, but now I have students from different languages writing in English and also to compare disciplinary variation. One of the things that I didn't show here, but in one of the dimensions, the students diverge, but it, it relates to how they write for the different disciplines. So these are some of the things that I'm doing in the future. And this is it. Thank you very much. I would like to take questions. Great. Thanks, Larissa. Awesome. I can already see Q&A. Oh, OK. I see <laughs> the first question is uh, from Caterini. And she asks, you have a research assistant. How does that work? So <laughs> why don't we have one too? So at NAU, we can, every fall semester, we can ask for a research assistant, but they have to choose us. And we agree with sharing our data with them. So they, these are undergrad students and it's a limited amount of uh, research assistants and you have to share your data with them because they're also writing a paper. I had a great experience with mine. I do recommend if you can manage to get research assistant at Pookie, I recommend you try that too. So my second question is, oh, I'm a starter in multidimensional analysis. Which books would you recommend for me to begin with? So I think I already mentioned Tony's book. It's really good. I would recommend reading all of that book and also a chapter. I swear I'm not making money out of recommending Tony's books, okay? I'm not on John Benjamin's or whatever publisher <laughs> that is. But there is a chapter from Hardy and Free Now. No, it's Free He Now and Hardy 2014 in a book that Tony organized to that's, I think, 25 years of multidimensional analysis. That book is really good if you're starting. That chapter is really good because it explains step by step on SPSS how to run. My main advice is to read a lot and try many times. Oh, would you mind differentiating? So I have another question by Hamisu Haruna. Would you mind differentiating multidimensional and multi meta discourse studies for me? What are their areas of convergences and divergences? So to be honest, I don't know what meta discourse studies are. I'm guessing, does Tony or Joe? No, so I'm, I'm gonna have to- I don't know. I'm going to have to Google this, or maybe you can write a comment here and explain to us what a meta discourse study is, and then we can uh, answer your question. I'm gonna open the chat, see if there is. Oh, uh, Leo, it's- saying to us that that's more genre analysis, uh, meta discourse studies. So it's basically a different approach of how we see the language if it is uh, genre analysis. So Maria asks, how do discipline sample in Bowie compare to those in Bowie? The, there emerges disciplinary specialization in your MD and analysis, but you seem to say the register of variation overrides disciplinary specialism. Can you say more on this? Yes, I can. So yes, Maria, you are 100% right. And the problem, which is already solved, is that the students, the Brazilian students who were in the UK, they were mainly from hard sciences, so physical sciences and life sciences, because that was their funding. And because of that, I cannot really compare disciplines using just these 
students. So that's why I'm adding more languages to my corpus so that I can add also uh, arts and humanities and social sciences. So I'm using uh, two other corpora, uh, BAWI, the L2 students, and also an ETS corpus compiled by Doug Biber and Randy Rappin so that I can actually compare discipline and register variation because I don't mean to say that disciplines, that register variation overrides disciplinary specialism. That's actually one of my research questions. I also want to know that. Uh, I have another one by Rogério that says, or maybe Rogério, has the methodology adopted in the study been able to handle outliers, such as, for instance, Statistics about text written in a type of language not usual for the respective register category. Yes. So here, what I'm using is the main dimension score overall. But yes, it happens that I have some outliers. But because this happened in language, and this is actually one of my research questions related to the situational characteristics of this text, I did not exclude them because in the future I want to analyze the motivation, why are these outliers? Um, I have, okay, Adriana, can you talk a little more about your plans for your dissertation? How are you collecting data and what registers are you focusing on? So for my dissertation, I'm using this corpus that I collected on my master. So it's Brazilian students writing, uh, writing for their undergrad in England and also using Bowie students who are L2 students, so they're also in England writing for their undergrad studies, and this other corpus that for now we're calling the ETS corpus, which is also L2 students in English writing. And so for the different registers, so for this pilot, I was focusing on these registers that I described from the data. But for my dissertation, I'm still working on all of the registers that I have on my data. So right now I have 16 registers, but it's likely that I'll have to put some of them together. For example, annotated bibliographies with summary might go together. Yes. So also Adriana has another comment. By the way, the Crow team is collecting disciplinary writing. So assignments from undergraduate engineering things like lab reports and yes so the crow team it's also a great resource so if you don't know the crow corpus go to the crow corpus website it's a great resource if you're teaching writing there's a lot of things there and you can talk to adriana who's one of the participants here if you need access to it she might be mad at me later because i'm sharing her asking everybody to talk to her uh, what do you expect to find in a further study, including cross-disciplinary cross variation? So I don't have any pre-assumptions. I do think that some registers will, um, will look differently across disciplines. For example, mainly critiques, because critiques of physical sciences, they are critiquing a specific object that's not abstract. But critiques of uh, arts and humanities, for example, they are looking usually at an abstract idea. So I do think that some registers will look differently across disciplines. Yeah, Adriana just posted the link for the Crow Carper that I was talking about. Um, Marilisa uh, said, how long did it take you to identify the different dimensions from your data? How hard was it? Any advice on how to proceed? Yes. So the statistical analysis, it's very fast. I mean, you press a button, you do some math, and you have the results. Now, the interpretation of the dimensions take a long time, and reading a lot of grammar, a lot of grammar and other studies who have uh, also studied the same uh, the same like register that you were doing. I think that for the dimension interpretation, so when you have the different linguistic variables, what you want is to have someone with you. So you want to have a pre-interpretation, but have a group of researchers with you that you can discuss your interpretation with, and also uh, to talk about this, because there's so much grammar that comes out of it, and you really need to have a good grasp of grammar to interpret this dimension. So I would say, reading a lot of grammar and having other people who know grammar. 
Um, I have Viviana. Thanks, Viviana. And Risa, you also sample gender differences in these registers. No, I don't because I don't have that information, but I think that would be very interesting. It's, it might be a topic of research for the future. Here is the idea for you guys. I think these were all, oh, no, I have one more. Uh, if you see a conceptual difference between, so the question is from Sergio. I would like to know if you see a conceptual difference between register variation, communicative purposes, and genre social purposes. Yes, because um, here we can see, so one of the things here is that register variation and genre studies are a little bit different. They see language in a different way. So genres are usually studying the different, um, so they are usually looking at the formatting and they're usually looking at these things that happen in all of the text while a uh, register, it's coming from the data, the categories that you have. So I would say, yes, and it's kind of saying that I'm going to study eggs and oranges. They're both round, but they're different um, ways of seeing this. So yes, I see a conceptual difference. Um, let me see if I have more questions. Okay, I don't I have, do have any one. more questions. Okay, Tony. <laughs> I was um, looking at your dimensions and I noticed that your first and third dimensions are pretty close to what we usually get in, in many MD studies. So in English, we, we have this dimension one that separates the mm -hmm. oral registers from the more uh, literate registers. Mm -hmm. And so in other languages too, in Portuguese, in Spanish, in Portuguese, we even have two similar mm -hmm. dimensions along those lines. And you also have two that are somewhat close, number one and number six, I think the first and last one. Yeah. So. I was wondering if you could comment on this, that these things keep, you know, re reappearing. And, and, and so we, we, we tend to get this opposition between the more spoken-like registers and the more written-like registers. You know, if, did that surprise you at all that you got those or that you so got two of those? <laughs> This is a great chance to already plug another paper that I'm working on. So watch for yeah. Margaret Wood coming soon, <laughs> uh, coming soon to a journal next to you. So yes, this is a very common thing, right? To find the literate versus oral uh, distinction. And I wasn't surprised at all. And actually there is something that I didn't talk about here is that usually these ones that have more features that we associate with oral registers, they are registers that students write uh, to simulate professional practice. So what I mean by simulated professional practice are, for example, case studies, because this is something that you will have to write if you go into uh, work as a doctor. Or, for example, designs or lab reports. These registers that students will have to write outside of their undergrad career actually usually have these features. They load in these dimensions that have more features of oral uh, things, right? And these registers that are more associated with academic practice, let's say research reports or argumentative essay, informative essay, they usually go to this dimension that we associate with literate features. So I wasn't surprised. What I was surprised was that there was this divide between the registers that I still need to investigate more. I think you have one question. In the Q&A again? Uh, yeah, so would you consider a lexical dimension? Yes, I would consider not for my dissertation, but uh, my dissertation right now has already four different like statistical analysis, so I think we're fine right now. And But yes, I would consider a lexical dimension for different purposes, especially on the Brazilian corpus because you see a lot of uh, things related to Brazil in that time. So I think it would be interesting to see the lexical patterns in student writing. And Hamisu asked for my 
email which was on the slide so i'm gonna share very quickly again so feel free to email me on lg845 at nau.edu also to follow me on twitter at lg but all the name now l goulart 845 i hope you got this and i think on the presentation on the webinar link at Lael, you also have our emails. Have another question. Uh, have you noticed any difference between academia in Brazil and the US? Oh, yes. So I'm open to answering these questions. There is a huge difference between academia in Brazil and the US. And I'm going to name the two that for me strike like the most. The first one is that I think in Brazil, we have way more pressure to publish and the turnaround for publications, it's like faster and you need to be like faster on this. Uh, even though like people who grew up and did their all their academic careers in the US will say that, oh, but you'll have like a lot of pressure to publish. Yes, but you haven't been to Brazil yet because Brazil is even harder. And the other thing is the academic career because of this pressure that you need to publish a lot in Brazil. People usually start doing research in their undergrad, so I think this is very different to, um, like I started doing my research while I was in undergrad, and this is not that common in the US. So I think these are the two main two things for me. And Claudia has a question. You said you're collecting tests from different L1 backgrounds to have other areas, but have you thought about comparing different L1 backgrounds in the same area? Yes, Claudia, I have thought about that. And my initial idea was to have a corpus only of Brazilian students writing in English, but it became too difficult because it's not very common for Brazilian students to go abroad. And I didn't want to enter a lot of different variables in my study. Like for example, students writing in Brazil in English and students writing in a context where English is the, their second language like in the UK. So I decided to actually have different language backgrounds and try to wash this effect of L1 background than to have a Brazilian students writing in Brazil or writing for just their language class than this other option. So this is how I made this decision, but maybe in the future I will look at the different L1 background. It's just one PhD for now. <laughs> Postdoc. So Oh, what will you do after your PhD? That's a very good question, Justin. And uh, we'll see, ask me that in two, three years, maybe. I'll let you know. So. Okay, I think I have more questions here. Oh, you do? Uh huh. Oh, there's more. Oh, okay. Can you, this is Claudia again. Can you tell us how we can take a PhD in the US? So I think if you have a lot of questions about uh, how to get into a PhD in the US, I have, there is already a Larissa webinar about that in the Partiu Intercambio website. But very briefly, uh, what you have to do to enter a PhD in the US is to take the GRE to have a proficiency exam score like IELTS or TOEFL and to ask your professors for recommendation letters and decide universities you want to apply. Usually when you apply to a university and they accept you, they will give you funding. So they will give you a TA ship or an RA ship. It's not, it doesn't happen in all universities, but it's good to do some research before. So for example, I teach 20 hours. So I work 20 hours a week and I teach English writing for international students. And with this, I don't have to pay for my PhD and I get a stipend. So this is how everyone can do their PhD in the US. Oh, yeah. So Adriana just said that a lot of universities are dropping the GRE requirement, which is true. And some of them accept only TOEFL and some of them accept only IELTS. So it's good to do some research. 